Hey, everybody. Welcome to the American Songwriter Podcast Network. This is All Heart with Paul Cardall. Welcome to this special edition of All Heart. I'm your host, Paul Cardall. It's special because we're going to be speaking with the founder, Brian Paul, of Saving Tiny Heart Society. This is one of the best fundraising charities making such a huge difference in the lives of thousands of people affected by congenital heart disease. This is the number one infant related cause of death. I've spoken about this many times. I'm a survivor. I got the heart transplant over 10 years ago, which was kind of like the, the finale of all these surgeries that I had had throughout my life. You know, it's like I used to have this beat up old truck, you know, that everybody had driven, you know, grandpa had passed it down. It was rusty, it was gross, but it was a beautiful, beautiful truck. Everybody lived, that was my old damaged, defective heart that I was born with. And imagine them saying to you, you gotta turn that in. Well, you got all that nostalgia of grandpa and everything. Well, you gotta turn that in and they give you the keys to a Porsche. That's how I felt after getting my heart transplant. You know, I have full oxygen levels in my brain. It's almost like my body's completely rewired. It's been amazing to have this new heart and it only happened because of medical research, advancements in technology and the funding that it takes to do these things. After the, the transplant, I, I, so many people, so many people, you, I know many of you prayed for me to be alive. And there were so many people that contributed to our, our family. There was a fundraiser that I wanted to figure out how to give back. And so I was actually in the intensive care unit recovering from the transplant when a friend of mine says, let's do a concert at a Bravenal Hall. This was ambitious because this is the symphony hall and the most, you know, popular place to hear a symphony in Utah. And I hadn't played it yet. So I didn't even think I could sell, you know, a thousand seats. We planned the concert. It was amazing. Everybody came. It was one of the most inspiring events. We raised $65,000. We took that money and we gave it to the Salt Lake Community College to create an endowment so that there could be scholarships for people affected by congenital heart disease. And why did I choose that? It's because I know a lot of people that because of their chronic illness, they aren't sure if they're going to live They're not sure what their situation is. And so they don't have goals. They don't necessarily always focus. And I wanted to be one to say, listen, you can survive, change your mindset. Let's focus on getting an education. But then you have all these medical bills. And so how are you supposed to pay for college? That's why we did this. We want to help. And you can find out about this scholarship on my website, paulcardall.com. Those of you that are in the Utah area or surrounding those areas, it is a full ride scholarship available to you who are affected by congenital heart disease. Well, after that, I realized, you know, that's just one drop in the bucket. What else can be done? That's when I met Francie, who is the wife of Brian. Francie and Brian Paul, they invited me out to Chicago to host a gala that I didn't know about Saving Tiny Hearts, but that night I learned, not only is this the best couple in the world that knows how to organize a gala that is so interesting and so impactful that I tell everybody that if you're gonna pull off a gala, you gotta first go to this one and learn how it's done. But secondly, they have a son who had been born with congenital heart disease and uh, they were so unsure of, his future that they went to battle and they started saving tiny hearts. And we're going to talk all about this and how they're fundraising some of the events they have coming up, but we're going to talk about this amazing, this amazing group of people that have congenital heart disease. You are my family, my blood brothers, my blood sisters, and it's so good to be alive. So sit back, relax, and listen to this amazing interview we recorded last week. This is uh, Brian Paul. <laughs> What's happening, fella? 
How you doing, brother? Good, how you doing? Good to see you. You got uh, everything squared away. It looks quiet. Uh, it's not quiet. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best. Not quiet. Uh, Francie's upstairs. I'm sure she's, sure she's going to drop in a little bit later, but trying to get ready. Yeah. Uh, dogs are in here. I'm sure there's going to be a kid or two walking in and a dog barking any minute. In all my years of living with congenital heart disease, for those listening, there have been countless organizations that have aggressively tried to prevent further deaths of infants because yeah. congenital heart disease is the number one cause of infant-related deaths. We have a million children, approximately a million children born every year. Yeah. Uh, world with some form of defect and most of these require immediate surgery or eventually in their lifetime they will require surgery i had you know the three major surgeries that most children born with a complex uh defect have and there's i guess what brian there's like over 40 there's so many different kinds yeah of defects it's like buying a house with an unusual sprinkler system and then trying to get a guy to come in and try to fix the yeah. problem to make it fun. Uh, i don't think much has changed from when we first met in terms of the discussions we had in terms of the comp in terms of the difficulties in the market for lack of a better term or why we're doing what we're doing and uh where medicine's heading i think it's uh, very uh very consistent so do you feel like we're, you know, we're funding a Band-Aid or are we funding solutions? No, no, I think it's very forward moving. I think that the future, I, I think the future of all medicine is tissue engineering. I still think we're very, uh, very aggressively going toward that. I think that's realistic. To get to a point where there's, where we're growing our own organs and specifically a heart is a, is a very uh, heavily favored organ to grow. It's, it's complicated, but it's nothing like growing uh, some of the other organs. What? The success at it. Has there been other organs that have been developed yet? I mean, I don't think we've seen any organs yet developed. They've tissue engineered um, uh, for implantation, very small stuff, pieces, things like that. I mean, they've grown ears and things like that, for sure. Right. And that where they put, uh, where, where they're able to uh, <clears throat> do more structural type. We funded something back in probably about 10 years ago was uh, the beginning of this. There was a doctor in Minnesota who actually went to Texas. She's a leading uh, a leader in this field in Texas. And they've actually down there cloned a, I think they, they might have cloned a human heart that had some faint beating, but I'm not, nothing that would be clinical whatsoever. But they're getting there. And then we funded one in Chicago, and that doctor eventually moved to Maryland for a very similar uh, type endeavor that one he cloned he actually did clone a rabbit heart as part of our experiment uh, we funded him two years in a row it was beating in a lab we have videos of it we saw it so it's going that direction but the ultimate uh a victory is to be able to grow organs from your own from your own uh dna yeah yeah i know like when i had my fontan actually the uh endocarditis i had with an endocarditis is an infection infection on the heart and this was on the precise spot that i had been born with uh, uh ad abnormally and when i went to go have that surgery to remove that they discussed you know do we put in a synthetic a material and they said you know if we do that he probably will not survive very much in order for us to do the fontan and so they took a vein they took natural tissue out of my leg they took a vein they cut it halfway through they laid it flat they wrapped it around a tube and they sewed it shut so it was a literal tube created out of the tissue of my body my dna and so but i mean the idea of growing a human heart i mean during that process i was when i was waiting for a heart they said or even early on they were like you know, let's get some DNA sample. Let's get some tissue of your heart because maybe we can eventually grow that. And, uh, you know, the question was, how far away? How far are we uh, from actually pulling that off? Because that's so. I don't think we're that. I, we're, I mean, the, the people on our medical advisory board can better 
indicate when they think it actually starts to become clinical. I don't know if you remember, we're, I think we're within a year or two of age of each other. Back in the 80s, there was Baby Faye who got the mechanical heart. Uh, baby, baby Faye, I think it was. We got a mechanical heart back in the day. It was a failure, but it was the thing that people couldn't even imagine something like that. But they've come so far from back then. And I, I, 10 years, I think. It's getting there. It's getting there a lot. I think Dr. Wald, who is on our board of directors, was the head of our medical advisory board for a while. Uh, he, he could better indicate something like that. But I, this is absolutely where medicine is going. Uh, the therapies have gotten tremendous. As you and I have talked about in the past, the biggest uh, uh, hurdle right now we hear from a lot of people who are uh, in between your age and Joshua's age uh, is that uh, late teens, early 20s, and not having a doctor to go to. That right. entire field of medicine, is, is, there's a void. And there actually still is. I'm still hearing, uh, Haley was saying, uh, Haley Mal, I remember her. She was talking about, uh, she just went back. I think she's back at a pediatrician now. She's 25. Because the doctors, uh, the older doctors are not able to, to accommodate what she needs. They just don't understand what she has. The doctor uh, to get her to where she is. Yeah, and this is one of the biggest problems that we're talking about is when you turn 18, you've had, you'd have special care in the, in the children's hospitals and, you know, they watch you, but then you hit that 18, it's like you got to go to the adult hospital, but there hasn't been enough education for the, the basic cardiologists do not understand the complexities. It's a specialty. So you get to the university hospitals and the county hospitals and they just, they send in the, the guy to look at your heart, the echo, the girl that comes in to look at your echo. And it's like, I, kind of, I had this happen to me in a small town. They just could, could not help but want to study the heart for like hours on end because they never seen anything like it. No one ever educated them. No one told them. And so you go and you live in these communities and you have a child with congenital heart disease. It complicates, complicates sure. things. Go. Go, go, go. All right, look at my dog out. Tell you what, you're lucky to have grown up where you did, and we're very fortunate to be to, to live where we are, where there's where there's medicine that's in the, the front wave of the way, front of the way. And uh, imagine all the people that don't have access. To yeah. yeah, medicine is not equal in the country. It's not a matter of uh, where, where you're at politically. It's just reality. There's only there's only one best, and there's only a handful of of the top tier doctors, and there's a bunch of doctors don't have that information and don't have that experience and just get tears. So the uh, best medicine, you, you're so lucky to have grown up in uh, Salt Lake City like you did and we're in Chicago and it's, it's we're fortunate. That's why we do what we do to fund medicine. We're funding around the world. We fund it now in four, five countries, something like that. And we want the best medicine to be out there, the best therapies, the advanced um, uh, things we can come up with that are relevant for What's one, what are some of the uh, recent research projects you guys have funded that have completely changed the, the way of Boy, doing things? This is, uh, it's funny you asked me that. I'm probably the wrong person to ask that. <laughs> I, we, and, and I say that because, and it's actually a testament I think to, to what I love about our organization is, we don't have any say in where the money goes. It is absolutely a medical advisory board, 100% that dictates that they are completely autonomous. They make the recommendation that we fund what they say. That It is so uh, ingenuitive and so complex this stuff that I, I mean, I'm understanding a little bit of it, but it, it's very, very complex, uh, uh, complex yeah. studies that they're doing. We did fund uh, a couple of years ago at Ohio State, we funded a... Um, uh, why kids, uh, it's something very relatable to your audience, I would think as well, is why kids collapse on sports fields and undetected uh, birth defects. We did fund a study on that. And uh, so that was one that was something that everybody can understand. A lot of what we do is uh, DNA work to understand, can, can we forecast what's gonna happen so they can do therapies very early on. Uh, we did find the, uh, the heart uh, tissue growing one a few years back. Uh, on our website, all of them are listed. 
Yeah, yeah I'm seeing uh, 2019, you guys funded about 524, well, half a million dollars, uh, plus an additional 75,000 for research of genetics with congenital disease, therapy for fatal arrhythmia in babies, yeah. uh, mothers identifying genetics. I mean, this is all the, this is all the nerdy stuff uh, that, you, you know, <laughs> that these guys understand. And I've sat in those meetings when they decide and review uh, you know, used, having used to be on the board, I'd sit in those meetings and watch these guys decide what was, I guess, the best option to fund because you got countless projects these guys all want to do. They all want to get a hold of some money. We all, the money scarce. The government is definitely cutting back on research. And uh, what we do is very rare. There's not a lot of people who are funding congenital heart defect research. Yeah. Congenital heart defects is not a very desirable um, place for corporations to put their money. They don't put it there. They put it on onset. They put it on unhealthy lifestyle type heart issues, uh, late in life heart issues, because there's the population is much bigger. Uh, most people in the country will end up having it, so they put their money there. Where you are the anomaly, absolutely. When you were growing up, kids to get to team was, was novel, just what didn't exist. So corporations back then weren't putting any money in this general heart defect, uh, research or therapies or medicine. The money wasn't there, just the kids weren't living, so it wasn't worth, the population wasn't there to make the investment. Bad, but it's just the reality. So all the money went there. And now it's, it's not, they're doing much, much better now. The average life of, of kids, uh, age bands from when you were growing up to now is double, triple, and uh, so medicine has come a far, far, far away since then. Uh, there's a lot more to do. There's a lot more to do. There's a ton to do. I mean, you constantly, we're constantly having children born with a, uh, you know, an abnormality. But the, the thing that's amazing is, you know, like when I was born, uh, my mother had, there was no detection in the womb where now you can detect in the womb whether your child is going to have a, a, a defect. Did you guys know when Joshua? Nope. They missed you, it. They missed it. This is actually the story of our entire uh, our entire founding of Saving Tiny Hearts. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you recall this one. Uh, Joshua's doctor, uh, uh, Francis' doctor, Joshua was there yet. Francis' doctor was uh, this typical North Shore Chicago doctor, just very lazy. And uh, they, they missed that Joshua has three chambers in his heart and little four, which is, uh, I don't know how you possibly miss something. So uh, after Joshua was born, four hours later, maybe he had turned ash from blue, got rushed down to Memorial Hospital. Had, uh, that's when we found out about his defects, went through all this there. But as part of that, uh, we were really upset. It was our first child, so we had to grow up overnight. And uh, actually went to go see a lawyer. The laws in Illinois allowed for lawsuits based on this um, uh, it's not a diagnosis, misdiagnosis, I should say, but also just missing something that, that's, that's this big. We weren't able to tell if Joshua was going to have any uh, uh, impact of, had they found it, would have been different, but he was without oxygen for several hours of his life. Could have been downtown in the NICU, uh, in the ICU when he was born, he wasn't. So, was born. Uh, so we didn't know. But anyway, we went to go see the power brokers down in the city, the, the big time uh, malpractice sat in their office, uh, one of the major players in Chicago wanted to take our case. And uh, there was, uh, in Illinois, there's something called wrongful life, which uh, is pretty easy to figure out what that is. We got, we, we walked out of there and, and France and I were in the elevator and uh, like, this is not for us. And something like this, let's, let's positive as opposed to something negative. So I literally pulled out my phone, called my corporate attorney, um, normal business. And I said, hey, how do we start a charity? Because Joshua's surgeon had told us there's a scarcity for money. Every parent wants to know, what can we do to help? Everybody everybody says, I want to help. I want to use That's a normal instinct. But uh, we actually did it. And uh, called the lawyers and how do we start a charity? And literally came up with it and started it pretty much in the elevator on the way out. There. So that's actually how we started it. Had had they not missed what Joshua had, I don't know if we hear it today. It's it doesn't really. Yeah, yeah. It's all been grassroots. 
funding in essence yeah, 100 your community and people from around the country that have gotten involved yeah. uh brett bear the anchor at fox news is involved what was the connection there how was brett uh so Brett Bear, Haley Nowen, who, um, you know, uh, Haley and Brett's wife come from the same community in the Chicago suburb. We just met a bunch of people out that way. And I think that's how we made it. I'm pretty sure it came through. Uh, but Brett, Brett Bear has been wonderful, uh, very non political, and he's non political, I'd say. So he's good. But uh, yeah, we're not a political organization anyway. We have people who all the spectrum we all uh it, 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 like any disease it doesn't discriminate on sure that's been absolutely wonderful uh we have charles tillman uh chicago bear now in the fbi very involved wonderful wonderful man uh tom riles who was very connected in hollywood and that circuit well, tom was tommy riles was he was just on uh yeah, well he does the opening he opens the audience for ellen so he was actually just on with his wife they were just doing. They were just heard, doing, yeah, like, doing, no, doing a that. segment. Yeah, just doing a segment about that story. So I think. Do you think by now people pretty people pretty much know about congenital heart disease, or do you think people are still no, worried about it? No, I think that it, we feel like everyone knows, but when you you've been around it so long and your life is surrounded by each body. Yeah. And uh, Josh was young, was bumping to more people. We met a ton more people. People are introduced because of the many hearts, right? But it's amazing just how people don't understand. And we hear all the time people are very involved in the organization. That probably the most common term I hear is we had no idea about this fact or that fact. The thing that's difficult for our cause and all, all these, I love charity in general. One of the things that we say, even when we're doing a itch or a speech somewhere that even if someone's not going to support our charity to support a charity is very we appreciate we support a ton of other charities that have nothing to do with the um the thing that's really hard about congenital the heart defect your microphone sales pitch of it what's your that mi your microphone keeps cutting out hear me now yeah it keeps well, better or now that's much better so the, the thing that is um, very hard for us is that congenital heart defects, just looking at, if you were to see Joshua now, uh, he is uh, a normal kid. You would have no idea looking at him that congenital heart disease. Well, looking at you, you'd have no idea you went through what you did. We're not competing with a cancer or Down syndrome. Nothing to do with that, but there, there's signs when somebody may have cancer, there's visually something you can see that, that, as there might be that, that there's something on there. Down syndrome, very similar to the thing. But there's many, many things, uh, many causes where there's a uh, visual. And look at Joshua and you think that he is a, uh, he is perfectly healthy. Expect him to be tomorrow. And you never know what the future is going to bring. Right. But it's, uh, it's been tough and it's not, it's not, um, it's it's something we we have to fight through. It's something that we really have to that hurdle we have to continue. To pass. We are the only organization that we know of in the country who raises money strictly for congenital heart defect research with no overhead, no paid employees. So there's another organization or two out there that does congenital heart defect research. Uh, one of the main ones had some uh, some major problems with uh, embezzlement or their old uh, executive director and all that. We're, uh, we're avoiding all that. We were transparent. That's why earlier you said, where is our research going? What was the funding? Uh, I should know, and I'm embarrassed that going on this phone call. But it, a, it, it, because we're a, so transparent in yeah. terms of letting people do their jobs and the oversight. You know, everything we do as an organization, my company, uh, my, my, my normal job, I'm a general contractor, industrial. We, the same practices we have there for oversight in a, and a half billion dollar company, we do it same in tiny hearts to make sure there's transparency and there's, there's the other thing that's fascinating with you guys is when you started, you started, you had your first, I think your first gala scenario, 2007 to 2009. 
uh, there was $52,000 allocated the following year, a hundred thousand, then you stick, you know, and, and you know, we could talk money all day, but the actual number of, uh, research projects increase significantly with the more money you raise, you've gotten better at knowing how to grow, grow the funds. Yeah. Um, so, so I think a lot of, like, cause I've had a lot of people go, where's a gala that we can go and observe and, and know like how to do a gala. And I always say saving tiny hearts because you Fantastic. guys, it's all great. Our gala work. is the best. I, I, my wife, Francie has, uh, that, that's her thing. She started, she did the first one. Every year we learn more. We try not to make the same mistake twice. Try to, everybody knows why they're there. We try to give just amount of, enough information there, uh, let people really enjoy it. But the whole thing about the gal is to have fun. We want people to enjoy being there. It's a tremendous fundraiser for us. And, and that is, it's my favorite event. It got canceled for this year, unfortunately. Sure. Getting pushed till next year. It's, you, the thing about what we do, you made a comment before in 2007, we, we funded a project in eight and nine and so on, and then we raised more and more. Back then, we did not have a medical advisory board. We just gave money. We started by giving money to our hospital. To, um, and uh, everybody thinks that their own hospital is the best. Everyone thinks their own doctor is the best. Their own lawyer is the best. Their own, everyone thinks, every, and, and, and you should think that. Yeah. But the reality is, is that the best research is not necessarily being done at your house, done around the world. And that's why uh, we actually, you know the story of how our medical advisory board started? I didn't mean to segue. Like, no, no, but, no, but, no, but I'm interested in how that started. This is a great one. So we, uh, we had a little medical advisory board that started with uh, some friends of the doctors at our hospital, kind of did a making, but it wasn't a formal one. And this medical advisory board, the wonderful guys, but they were, they, they were pushing the money like a good old boys now. And a lot of medical advisory boards end up this way. And that, that was really, uh, as I learned now, in the back. <laughs> so we had, and, and I hope Lauren Wald watches this video because this, uh, this is all about him. So he applied for a grant and heard about us. And he was denied for his grant because for those, he was. For those listening, Lauren is uh, head of research at Ohio State. But Lauren Wald is who's now on our board of directors, and that you'll hear that story in a second here. Uh, Lauren is a very renowned researcher in the country. He's got his uh, bunch of labs at the Ohio State University there, well respected throughout the entire uh, medical community in, in research of heart related topics. Yeah. Oh, uh, Lauren actually doesn't get funded, and he calls us out. He goes and reaches out to Larry Kluge, the chairman of our board. And he starts going, this is the first grant I have ever been denied. And, and he's, he's very direct. He's not pompous and arrogant like that, but he's right. He was right in this case. And he goes, you're, uh, what, I don't know, I shouldn't say any bad words. I kind of thought it out here. Because, uh, um, your, uh, your process is baloney. Uh, you're, you're, you're funding the same circle of people. We had no insights to that. This is very early on. This is a long, long time ago. This is a mistake so many people raising money end up doing. You end up just donating to the hospital, which 50% goes to the house, 50% goes to the project, and the project might go to go into overhead. I mean, it's just people don't know where their money's going. That, that is a reality what we do. But Lauren calls out Larry, and Larry calls them out back. Larry goes, if you don't like how we're doing it, then put your money where your mouth is and head up our medical advisory board and show us how to do it. So we literally disconnected our medical advisory board the next day all Lauren in, Lauren brought in people from across the country, and he brought in NIH-type protocols, National Institute of Health Protocols, which is the, the benchmark of all uh, research in the world. And uh, so now our, our medical advisory board is, is a, that was the grassroots of it, and now we have all NIH protocols, how we judge it, uh, how we do our, our review meetings. And so it all started, with, and Lauren headed that up for a handful of years, and he stepped off, and uh, we rotate that on purpose just so we don't get that that mentality of uh, being a good old boys network and we rotate people on. It a certain amount of time you can be on there, but Lauren is actually now on our board of directors. That all started from us thinking that we knew best on where to listen to the people directly in our lives on what to do with it, and uh, that's how we ended up with our medical advisory board and the lovely Warren Wald into our life. <laughs> that's amazing. 
he's an amazing person. What he's uh, yeah, what he's accomplished, and uh, the website savingtinyhearts.org shows all of the uh, the advisory board, and these are some of wow. So Dr. Farah Sheikh. Yeah, she's at San Diego State. I believe she's mm -hmm. in San Diego. Yeah. I think it's San Diego State. She was uh, on board, then she went to Pro Tempore, and now she's the head of the medical advisor. Our website's getting actually redone. We're rolling out the new one in December, so please disregard the uh, <laughs> visuality. Uh, it's lacking, and uh, some of the content needs is uh, is stale right now. So the main thing on our website, literally, why we're not shutting it down now and putting the new one up, we have a, a uh, uh, a fundraiser in December that we're signed up as on website right now for so the uh, the medical advisor board. What's the what's the number one lesson you've learned fundraising? What's the lit that other people can apply when they go out there and try to say, you know change the world? Oh, schmoly! <laughs> <laughs> like what's one wow. one thing that you're glad? that you discovered in fundraising and maybe one thing that just you, you wish you had known well let me let me start by saying our organization specifically has a um has something that a lot of organizations don't which is we are a hundred percent volunteer based and you're not getting paid for something to, to find the right group of people that are going to put in the necessary time there's no accountability if you don't do the job you really can't hire them I mean, you can, but uh, it's volunteer work. Hardest thing to do is to hold people accountable and do, to uh, motivate them and to have people who have a like mind are like minded to, to have a common cause. To uh, don't learn from your mistakes, that, that, that's you have to do. You have to have an open mind and really self reflect and understand the things you've done that, that didn't work and learn from them and don't repeat them. And that's why our gala is so good, is we try not to repeat the same mistakes, learn from everyone. Um, be nice to know some really, really, really rich people. That would, that would help. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 don't quite, we don't quite have that crowd yet, but uh, we're working on that. So. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a whole nother world of uh, fundraising that uh, uh, people try to tap into. Um, and it's really until they have somebody in their family, and they probably do. It's just a matter of connecting to find out who who has a child with congenital heart disease. I know because early on, you got your wife Francie started trying to find everyone that was somewhat of a celebrity who was known and brought them to the gala. Um, you know what? I take that back. Uh, before. I was completely wrong on how we met Brett Bear. Can I jump in real quickly here? Yeah, oh, we have totally Brett screwed Bear's that story. up. Okay. So, the people in Barrington knew Brett Bear. That's not how we found him. Okay. I had somebody from work, uh, a steel subcontractor of mine, Lee Carboy, I'll just throw his name out there. He sends me this article, and on the front of People, this is after Joshua was born, on the front of People magazine is Brett Bear. And his son was born, uh, Paulie, was born with a congenital heart. Mm -hmm. So it had nothing to do with the people out uh, west. That was actually after the fact. And they introduced us to Haley. It was the exact opposite. So Francie emails Brett Bear out of nowhere and says, um, uh, tells him our story. Our, our son, Joshua Benapal, uh, born with a congenital heart defect. We have a gala coming up. We're very small at this time. We're, we're, we're not a mom and pop shop. Our, we are. Our gallows were always, were always bigger than we were at the time. They were, they were much more impressive than probably the organization as a whole. So she emails Brett Bear, and Brett Bear responds, and he he later tells a story. And he tells it at the gala that uh, he gets thousand emails a year asking, being asked to come speak at events. So he, he he would like to respond to all of them and do all of them, but that's just not realistic. So, but there's something about this one that he goes and comes and talks to his wife, and he goes, Francie Paul has asked us to do something that's very near and dear and new in our life to come to the gala. He goes, my son is Paul Francis. And Francie Paul, it just emails, like it's a sign. So Brett Bear, who was at the time, I mean, he, he's always, he's been big for a long, long time, but he was, he was really coming to his own about that time as well. Yeah. He's a huge name. Ends up responding. He says, I'll do it. So that's actually how we met Brett Bear was Francie. And Francie, did that. that's how we pretty much meet everyone, to be honest is my wife uh, just gets out there and she's really yeah. 
in, in a very true and non-fake way, just a very uh, fair way. She really, uh, was doing this for the right cause. That's how we met Brad Bear originally, was Francie reaching out and that whole Paul Francis, Francie Paul can. It's interesting because just the inner weaving of all of our lives and how we all kind of come into each other's lives. And, you know, you like I, I, did, I learned about Matt Hammett and Sarah Hammett from Francie and now I'm in Nashville and, and Matt and I are in a, a small men's group we go to every Monday night um, and it's it's interesting because I wouldn't have met that family who has a son with heart disease had I not participated in this gala and you guys had I think you had the Hammets at the last gala. last year yeah uh, last year uh, Matt and Bowen came uh, they performed they each performed a song <laughs> And it, uh, it rocked the house. People absolutely loved it. Just cla classy, classy people, just down to earth, wonderful human beings. Did you get a chance to see their documentary? I have not seen it. Their documentary? They did a doc. It was the official. They were filming it, actually. It was a gala in it. Uh, they had cameramen with them at the gala, actually. They were I filming the whole thing. I didn't realize it was all put together. I knew they were doing a uh, uh, it, something there. It's the official selection of uh, Nashville's Film Festival, and, and okay. they're, they're locking up some distribution. But it is, I think it's the first full-length documentary that goes behind the scenes of what a, what a family experiences. And I'm very hopeful that people will see it because that will shed a light. And if there's a way to utilize that with the Saving Tiny Hearts, I think it can help tap into that some some markets for you guys yeah, sure uh, definitely check it out i uh, love that they're, they're wonderful just just very hamish people very kind people yeah i think that pretty much wraps it up just want to really get people aware of saving tiny hearts because it's so near and dear to me and a couple of years ago we did a we did an album are they has anthem been sending you money when yeah I mean, it's like clockwork it's like clockwork okay, it's, like okay. Out of it's out of canada i believe correct yeah, they are a Canadian company. We get emails um, every so often. We just got one the other day. Of uh, We found you through Paul Cardall, and, and I believe it's through the disc as well. We get that a lot, uh, so many a year from that, and always just kind things. And it's usually just uh, maybe a small donation of companies, more just comments. We met you through Paul Cardall. We love his music and uh, wish you guys the best. Things like that. Very nice comments. Penny, Penny's head up. They do. The, the, the disc itself, it's still selling because we're going to sell regularly. So. And we love it. So That's it's, cool. uh, it's wonderful. I can't tell you how appreciative of everything. Yeah. Well, if people want to know more, again, go to savingtinyhearts.org. Uh, learn more about this. you got to get to one of these galas because it's, it's my favorite. It's my favorite gala. My we, favorite uh, gala. You, you need to get up there next time. That's in, uh, next, it's in the, the October 21st, I think we have Okay. Very funny on that, but can I, can I plug our our our, uh, our tournament in uh, December? Heck, oh yeah, good. good. Uh, I was I was thinking it was like right around the corner, but if it's in December, we'll be December fifth. Okay. December fifth, online charity poker tournament. It's uh, it's on our website. The registration there. All the money will go to uh, to to the cause. It's our replacement of the gala this year, but it's uh, it's going to be awesome. It's it's an online. It's all virtual. So if anybody. Uh, enjoys playing there's there's cash prizes it's a pretty hefty uh sum for the winners so if there's poker players out there or non-poker players that like sick kids we're your guys so that's brilliant uh, that's brilliant because you can you know you can't go to a gala but you guys did a very successful poker poker uh yeah. at the gala and now you bring it virtually i mean people yeah. get around and playing solitaire in texas hold them anyways so yeah, nice well it is. It's a Texas Hold'em tournament on uh, online, and it's an app uh, that you download on your phone. I think they're gonna. We have a company actually helping to uh, to, to to put it together for us. Uh, the Who monitors actually have been right up online and helps them run it for yeah. us. But they are. Uh, I think we're doing Zoom uh, meetings and all that, so your tables will all be Zoom. So there will be some interpersonal communication on it too. So. Yeah, December 5th. December 5th, six, Saturday night, I think it's yeah. 6 p.m. Central. It's on the website right now, the registration. Yeah. But it'll be, uh, it's, it's, I think it should do very well. Uh, have you ever been to a, a, a charity poker tournament? I've never played poker in my life. Uh, hey, you won't play? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's the culture. It's, yeah, no, no. It's I, the religion I thing. But at the same time, I'm... Anyways. Charity <laughs> poker tournaments turning to... 
everyone thinks they're on the World Series of Poker. Everyone, it, it's funny. It's the one, the one type of sport, sport ESPN type thing you can do. That is, uh, you don't really need any athletic prowess for. So, no, uh, no. <laughs> Just bring some cash and then make sure there's not a hole in the pocket. Cash and a computer, you could be, you could be in there, but it should be fun. And that's the main thing is to raise money, and it should do very well, so we can continue to raise uh, money for Conjunto Harkey. Yeah, it's it's the best. That's the best place to play poker is when you're doing something for, for people. That's the way it should be. Yeah, absolutely. We, wouldn't we dramatically change Vegas if it was all for the children? <laughs> Those hotels don't come out of nowhere. <laughs> no, they don't. Hey, well, thanks for thanks for being on here, Brian. Tell Francie hello. I will. Uh, thank you. And Tina, yeah. please, the family, say hello to everyone. I hope everyone's doing well through these very, uh, very unique times. Yeah. yeah. Things settle down here next year. All right, brother. Be safe. I'll be well. Talk to you. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you want to watch these, you can go to my website, paulcardall.com. There are links under the podcast to watch them. And also we have a free song I've never before made available. You can get that by subscribing to my newsletter. We like to give away stuff. So until next time, we'll see you guys.